undergoing a battery of psychiatric exams. She was put on antidepressant and antipsychotic medication. As she became more stable, she started to reveal disturbing reasons for the murders. What were you trying to accomplish then when you did take your children's lives? Maybe in their, their innocent years, God would take them up. God would take them up to be in heaven? Is that what you mean? All right. And if you had not taken their lives, what did you think would happen to them? Yes, they would have continued stumbling. And where would they end up? Wanting to know what Andrea meant by stumbling, the psychiatrist then asked her about her children's behavior. What sort of things did they do which showed you they weren't right? Well, they, they weren't, uh, they just did a lot of silly stuff and didn't obey. Didn't obey you when you told them to do things. All right, you mentioned their manners before. Can you give me an example of their manners? This, his mom would visit, they would um, not treat her well, call her names. Be disrespectful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you concluded that they were not righteous, and you're a religious person, and explain to me what you meant by not being righteous. Well, they didn't do things God, they didn't do things God likes. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. How's everybody doing today? Today's show is brought to you by HelloFresh. Please visit HelloFresh.com and use the promo code TCB to save $35 off your first week of delicious deliveries. And they are delicious. Absolutely. I just did one last night. We'll talk about that during the ad. We definitely will. Now our episode today is a tough one. It's a discussion of postpartum psychosis and the Andrea Yates case. So it was at 9 a.m. on June 20th, 2001, when Andrea Yates, 36 years old, was sitting at her kitchen table in suburban Houston while her children watched cartoons. Her husband had left for his job in NASA's shuttle vehicle engineering office. Between 9 a.m. and 9.45 that morning, Andrea went into her guest bathroom, and calling her children in one at a time, she drowned them. Now, Andrea and her husband, Rusty, had five children. Noah was seven, John five, Paul three, Luke two, and little Mary just six months old. Now, Andrea had a lengthy psychiatric history. In fact, the couple had been advised not to have more children before their youngest, Mary, was conceived. She'd been hospitalized four times since 1999 for major depressive symptoms, postpartum depression, recurrent, and major depression with psychotic features. So the question we ask ourselves today is, how could these tragic deaths have been prevented? Is the fatal flaw found in our mental health care system, in the Yates family dynamics, in Andrea's misguided religious beliefs, or in a perfect storm of all of the above? I'm not going to lie to you, this case is heartbreaking, but it's also a case that brings to light the ways we manage and mismanage mental illness in our society, and the sometimes shaky line between devout religious beliefs and fanaticism. Now, before we get started, though, I'd like to thank our five-star reviewers. So, a big thank you to 51 Trillion, Molly 1C2000, J.R. Lamb 23, Miss Ginger 58, Courtney Jr., or Courtney J.R., Blue Jeep, Waldy One, Big Rig 612, Scott Schultman, Jenny F. 1584, Colorado Native 88, and of course, we can't forget Puka Puka Puka. Well, who could forget Puka Puka Puka? Welcome to the brewery, and thank you so much for your reviews. Come on down to the quiet end. we got a seat for you. We do. And Dick has a great beer review for us, I'm assuming. I do. I have a beer called Atrial Rubicite. Interesting name. I like it. It sounds cardiac-ish. It does, doesn't it? Yes. 
It's heartwarming. There you go. This is from Jester King Brewery in Austin, Texas. Now, Atrial Rubicite is an American wild ale. These beers are introduced to a wild yeast or bacteria. And these little critters impart a taste that can be strange, <laughs> interesting, pleasing to some, and undesirable to others. That sounds and, like me. Yeah, see? <laughs> but what I'm saying is that they, they can be tart, sour. Mmm, that sounds delicious. Yeah. I like that stuff. Now, this particular beer, this is one of the highest rated beers in Texas. It's a raspberry jam color with a lavender head. So it's kind of a pretty looking beer and not your typical appearing beer. It has a funky, oaky, raspberry aroma. The taste is all sweet and tart raspberry. Still that little bit of funky stuff in there and an oaken aftertaste. It's a light bodied, tart beer. Excellent to drink. Very good. Thank you, Dick. Let's open it up and head down to okay. the quiet end, of course. Let's do that. Okay, Dickie. I see we have two bottles and two snifters. Let's grab them and head down to the quiet end. I got them. Let's go. Okay. But I'm looking down there. Yes, I have been too. Where's our friend? The leprechaun's not here, and I thought with St. No. Patty's coming up, he'd still be here. I I would, too, and I thought we had a pretty good time with him last week. Yeah. I mean, he, he Did we misread to... the vibe? We thought we had a good vibe. I don't know. I, th I thought he was having a good time, and uh, we hit it off pretty well. And he said he'd be here this week. Well, according to the bartender, he might have had too good a time, if you'll notice. Come on down and look here at this jar. Oh, look at that. It says Free Mickey. Free Mickey. What's that? Bail money or something? Yeah, he was actually arrested last week. Oh, jeez. And he needs bail money. All right. Well, let's contribute. We will. We want a Free Mickey before St. Patty's Day. Yeah. That's coming up, what, the end of the week? We got a week. So let's Free Mickey. Okay. But he was a pretty cool guy. He is, yeah. I don't know what he did to offend anyone or for the arrest. I think we had left by the time he was arrested. Yeah, when we so, left, he seemed okay. He may have been in his cups, just as a, they say. Just a bit, but he was kind of a witty and charming drunk. Well, maybe after we left, he got past witty and charming. Aren't there different levels? There are. There's ten levels. What are the levels of... Is it the levels of drunkenness? Yes, and witty and charming is level one. Oh, uh, well, he was definitely beyond level one. Well, there's another witty and charming further down. Okay. But the, the final one is invisible. Oh. So I don't know that he reached that. Bulletproof is way up there, too. Bulletproof is dangerous. He may have been arrested in that phase. Yeah. Yeah. So but he might have uh, gotten out of the witty and charming stage and entered one of the higher stages. Well, let's just hope that we free him before next week so we can spend some time with him. I hope so. He okay. Was, like I said, he was fun. He was a real raconteur. Absolutely but we're going to have to get it together, settle in, and do our episode without him. Let's do it. So, Andrea Kennedy was her high school's valedictorian, and she was a competitive swimmer. She was the youngest of five children. Now, she graduated from the University of Texas School of Nursing at Houston with a BSN degree. Andrea was very studious and very shy. She didn't even date until she was 23 years old. Her mother had grown up in Nazi Germany, actually, and met her father during the British occupation. So after the war, her father worked at Ford Motor Company in Houston, and later he was a teacher. So when the family came across some difficult financial times, Andrea's mother went to work as a floor manager at J.C. Penney, and the family was very Catholic. Now, Rusty Yates, he was raised near Nashville, where he played football, and he was an active member in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes at DuPont Senior High School. He graduated third in his class and went to Auburn University on a Navy ROTC scholarship. Now, after his first year, he dropped out of the ROTC program, but he did continue to play football. Rusty met Andrea at the apartment building where he lived after college while he was working at NASA. Now, one night in October 1989, Andrea actually came along and knocked at his door. She introduced herself to him and said that someone had dinged her car in the parking lot the night before and asked had he seen anything. 
but Andrea had made up this whole dinged car story in order to meet Rusty because she thought he was pretty cute. Yeah, and by all accounts, he was uh, equally taken with her. Yes. And didn't he describe her as this goddess floating in the pool? He did in, in the book, yeah. 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 I and mean, they both were attractive and accomplished people. You can't argue with that. No. No. Educated? Yes. Dri- I don't driven? want to say driven. No, why not? Ambitious. How's sure. that? Sure. Okay. Yeah, Rusty had noticed her around the complex before, so when she knocked at his door, he was pretty happy. I bet. But he was pretty shy. So it wasn't until later that month when she got up the nerve and wrote a note and put it on Rusty's windshield, asking if he wanted to stop over and visit her sometime after work. So that was bold. That's pretty forward. Yeah. But Rusty went over the next night. He even gave up his watching football night to go see her. (laughs) Must be love. Yeah. And then soon afterward, they began dating. So Rusty introduced Andrea to his friends and religious mentors, Michael and Rachel Warnicki. And he'd listened to Warnicki preaching on the concourse near Auburn Tiger's Good Luck War Eagle cage and was intrigued by the preacher's beliefs. To Rusty, Warnicki was preaching the truth without hypocrisy. So Rusty had been raised Nazarene and Methodist, so he already had a pretty strong religious base. And he took some of the literature that Warnicki was handing out at the college. Now, Warnicki was a non-denominational Christian missionary who delivered his messages of the living Jesus on college campuses, sporting events, and political events. And he had a wife and six children who often accompanied him to these events, which were kind of outrageous, wouldn't you say? They were over the top. They they were over the top. They were real street shows. Yeah. I mean, not, nothing was held back when when Warnicki was preaching. Yes. And I, I just say up front here that neither of, neither of us are religious scholars. We don't know a lot about different religions, right? That's fairly true. Right. But it did seem like this was a little unusual, a little over-the-top preaching, not your normal Catholicism. Oh, by no means. So in the 90s, Warnicki and his family traveled across Europe and then to Africa, And in 1995, they preached in Casablanca, where it's actually illegal to preach about Jesus as the Son of God. So a riot occurred at one of their events in Morocco, and the family was arrested and eventually forced out of the country. So he wasn't a stranger to controversy. Actually, he seemed to thrive on it. Yeah, he did. Which is kind of strange that Rusty would get involved with that, because he seems like a much more conservative, kind of level-headed kind of guy. But he, he came to a point where he didn't adhere to the doctrines that were preached by Warnicki. Yes, that's right. And that's, I think, where some of the trouble lays. That's where Andrea and Rusty kind of branched off in different directions at that point. Right. Well, Warnicki preached that one must get alone, study the New Testament, and seek the living Jesus in order to be born again. And his interactions with Andrea, up until the time that she ended up killing her children, have been the subject of much scrutiny, which isn't surprising. No, not no. in the least. So early in 1992, Andrea and Rusty moved in together. Andrea felt a lot of guilt that they weren't married, but they were living together. But then Rusty did propose that Christmas, and they married in April of 1993. So even though Rusty was the only man Andrea had ever had sex with, she wouldn't wear her wedding veil over her face because she wasn't a virgin and she didn't think it would be right to do that at her wedding. No, I'm not commenting on that. So a few weeks before their wedding... You're not going to make me say anything. Okay. I see that in your face, and I know what you want me to say, but I'm not going for the bait. A few weeks before their wedding, they bought uh, a new four-bedroom house in Friendwood, Texas. Now, Andrea was pregnant within two months after they, they got married, and she and Rusty decided to accept as many children as God sent them. So she stopped birth control and kind of let go, let God, as far as family planning went. Well, that's good. I mean, God's not a very good family planner, though, is he? I couldn't say. I don't. I think that family planning is probably up to um, people. And if you want, I could do my two boats and a helicopter story here, which most people have probably already heard. That's true. But right. you can go ahead and give us that story, because it's an interesting story. Okay, so if you're talking about Andrea and Rusty saying that they're going to let God decide how many children they have. 
but you're also looking at the fact that we do have birth control and family planning available to us as people. We do, and, and we have the ability to make our own choices. Exactly, and that's kind of the point of the story. So in the story, there's a guy, and he's, and I'm just freewheeling this story, but as it goes, there's a guy, and there's a flood happening. So the water's rising, he's on his roof, and he prays to God to save him. So he's on his roof praying to God, and a guy in a rowboat comes by and says, get in the boat, you're going to get, you're going to drown, the water keeps rising. And the guy says, no, I've prayed to God, I have faith in God, and God's going to save me, right? So a little while later, a bigger kind of speed boat comes by, and they say, jump in the boat, you know, the water's getting really high, this is dangerous, get in the boat, we're going to take you to safety. But this guy says, oh no, I have faith in God, I've prayed to God, God is going to save me. So now the water's up to the roof, it's almost at his ankles. But he's still praying to God, he's still got the faith. So a helicopter comes by, throws down a ladder and says, hop in, the water's taken over, we're going to save you. You're going to drown, get in the helicopter. And he says, God's going to save me. God's going to save me, I've prayed, so go ahead without me, I'm all set, I'm putting my faith in God. So... The guy drowns. Well, yeah. And then he goes to heaven and he says to God, I prayed to you, why didn't you save me? I drowned. And God says, Well, I sent you two boats and a helicopter. What do you want? Right. So, to me, that applies to this case because if you believe in God, then God has provided you with the, the knowledge, the science to have family planning right. and birth he's, control. He's given you the power Absolutely. To do that. Yes. And if you're not using it, why not? I sent two boats in a helicopter. Why indeed. Right. So that's kind of what that makes me think of. A little bit oversimplified maybe, but I think it's pertinent. I think it applies. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So Andrea did continue to work her job at the hospital as a nurse until their first child, Noah, was born, and that was in February of 1994. Rusty would later say that Andrea wanted to stay home and be a full-time mother. But on the other hand, some of her friends said that she would have liked to return to work and be a nurse. But she stayed home to please Rusty. And this could be to please Rusty. It could also be because she had these strong religious beliefs. She felt she was obligated to stay at home. Well, yeah. Well, I don't know about obligated. I'm thinking that maybe she really wanted to stay home. That's possible. That's uh, what Rusty said. Yeah. But and it's also possible she felt obligated to stay home. Sure. We don't know. But uh, I think if, if I'm looking at the religious aspect of it, that they're going to have as many kids as God will provide, then it's going to be her job to be an at-home mom and raise the kids. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's probably true. I mean, it would be very expensive, right, to have all those kids and put them in daycare. It would. Yeah. Plus, I'm sure they had some pretty strong feelings about what the kids would learn and and do in a daycare situation. Well, we know that because yeah. she homeschooled them all. Right. So we, we know or, or infer uh, what their views on education are. Yes. No, but Rusty's a man of science, so do you think that they actually believed in creationism and didn't want to teach the kids evolution? Well, I don't I mean, know. That's, that's I mean, what makes me wonder. They, they hadn't gotten that far in their lives where that might become an issue, but I would I would just think that uh, a man of science, like Rusty, wouldn't believe in creationism. Oh, you can say that, but there are plenty that do. I know, but yeah. I'm just, and I'm probably putting words in his mouth. Right. From our aspect, if you're a scientist, you wouldn't believe in that. No. But we don't know what he was thinking, because he's definitely a different person. That's for sure. Yes. So, anyway, we don't know if that was her choice. I mean, it was her choice, I think, but we don't know if she really wanted to or if she felt obligated to do that for Rusty or for the religious beliefs that she held. Yes, so I think we can leave it at that. But anyway, that was the decision. The decision yeah. was made that she would stay at home. So in December of 1995, John Yates, their second son, was born. Now, when Rusty needed to work for six months in Tampa for his NASA job, the family put their possessions in storage, and they moved into a trailer home. So this was not bad. This was a 38-foot trailer, and they rented a lot in a nice campground. But then when they returned to Texas in 1997, Rusty wanted to continue living light and not go back to the house. And this is when they made this decision to buy a 350-square-foot customized GMC motorhome, and they bought this from the Warnikis 
after visiting them in Miami. So the trip to Miami that they made became kind of uncomfortable because the Warnickies were describing Rusty as a workaholic, and Warnicky didn't seem to approve of Rusty working and making money and accomplishing financial and, what would you say, I don't want to say superficial, but worldly things, I guess. Right, but at the same time, he's got an occupation to provide things for his family. Yeah, and maybe Warnicky was a little jealous of that. Possibly. But he said that Rusty was willing to sacrifice his wife and kids for the sake of his job and got kind of critical of Rusty for being successful in his career. Well, and that's when they had their falling out, or the beginning of their falling out between he and Rusty. Right, right. So Michael Warnicki said that Andrea was desperately lonely and that Rusty was failing her. And this is where they kind of broke it off. Rusty and Michael had their falling out. Right, but Warnicki continued to work with Andrea. Yes, he continued to talk to her, and so did his wife, Rachel. They continued to have correspondence with Andrea up until the end, actually. So here here the Yateses are back in Texas. He's uh, back at NASA. She's at home, and they bought this bus, motorhome. Pretty small, 350 square feet. That's very small. Very small, and in less than ideal condition. And there was some some thinking or some thoughts that uh, they had got taken by the Warnickies on this purchase. I think Rusty that, probably felt that way. That the Warnickies were less than forthcoming about some of the defects in this motorhome. Yeah, I think that's that's safe to say. Okay. So in 1997, again, they're back in Texas, back in Houston or the Houston area. Their third son, Paul, was born in 1997. So now they're a family of five living in this 350-square-foot motorhome. Yikes. It's, it could be stressful. I could see that. Oh, no kidding. In July of 1998, after the Yates had bought the motorhome, Rachel Wernicke wrote to Andrea telling her, the window of opportunity that God has opened up for you at this time through us will only stay open for a certain time. If you allow Satan to come in and steal the understanding, the consequences will be tragic. There will be a day when it is too late. Now, that's pretty dire. It was pretty dire preaching. It's fire and brimstone stuff. It was, yeah. But Rachel further wrote, We don't believe that day has happened yet. There is still hope. Andrew had been reading the Bible with increased intensity, encouraged by the Warnickies. Rusty only agreed with some of their ideas, but Andrew seemed to have embraced their extremism. And I think it's fair to say extremism, don't you? I do. And trying to be very objective here, but I think that's fair to say. Well, yeah. He, Wernicke preached that the role of a woman was derived from the sin of Eve and that bad mothers who are going to hell create bad children who go to hell also. Rusty and Andrea's family began to grow concerned over her literal interpretations of these preachings. I would be concerned. Well, they should be concerned. Yes, right. So Luke, Andrea's fourth child, was born in February of 1999, and she was taking care of the older boys and breastfeeding Luke every two to four hours. She was very isolated and sleep-deprived. And on June 16, 1999, Andrea called Rusty at work and begged him to come home. Now, when he got there, he found Andrea in the back room of the bus in a chair, kind of slouched over, and her legs and her hands were shaking involuntarily. She'd been chewing on her fingers till they bled. Now, not just her nails, but her actual fingers. And she told Rusty that she needed help. So Rusty really didn't know what to do. He didn't know much about depression, and he thought that maybe she was having a nervous breakdown but had no idea how to deal with that. And he decided to take her out for some fresh air. You know, I guess kind of a, you don't know what else to do, let's try that. Yeah, let's take a walk and unwind and see what we can do. Right, because part of her problem could have been being cooped up in that bus with the kids. Well, I'd be claustrophobic as hell in that thing. Yeah. So gathering the children in their strollers, he drove the family to the Gulf Coast in Galveston, and they walked along the seawall for a while. But Andrea didn't seem any better, so eventually he drove the family to Andrea's mother's house. So they stayed at their mother's house, and the next afternoon while the family was taking a nap, 
Andrea took 40 to 50 of the 50 milligram trazodone pills that had been prescribed to her father for sleep. So this was obviously an overdose. A suicide attempt. Now trazodone, antidepressant, sleep pill, what is it? Well, it's it's an antidepressant, but it, it also has a big side effect of sleep. So you're going to take so, it at night. So people would take it at night, uh, not just for their depressive symptoms, but to help them sleep. Right. And these days, kids that have attention deficit disorder and they're on stimulants, which sometimes disrupt sleep, uh, sometimes people use trazodone in the evening to help them sleep. Okay. And this was prescribed to her father who had Alzheimer's disease, so probably to help him sleep at night. Definitely. Because they can definitely have sleep disturbances. Yes. So this amount of medication could have killed her. It certainly could have. Absolutely. But her mother found her in time and rushed her to the emergency room. So at the emergency room, doctors assessed Andrea, they lavaged her, and they gave her liquid charcoal to drink. Now notes by the intake nurse, Anita Lopez, described Andrea's reason for admission as an overdose, and that Andrea had said she didn't want to die, but she wanted her misery to go away. So Andrea had lost 10 pounds in less than three weeks. She had low energy, poor concentration, and poor eye contact. She was feeling hopeless and fatigued, and she was described as evasive when asked questions about her problems. So after about a week in the hospital, Andrea was released and she had been diagnosed with major depressive disorder and prescribed an antidepressant. Which one? Do we know? I'm not sure at that point was which that one. Was that the Zoloft one? I think it, Zoloft was probably the first one she was prescribed. Right. Now, on the first day of her hospitalization, Dr. James Flack wrote, She just wanted to sleep forever. He also raised the question of whether she suffered from some delusional guilt, and he marked Andrea as high risk for suicide or self-harm. Now, Andrea claimed that she had been well until her fourth child was born. Well, yes, although we, we know that she had some mental health issues as far back as high school. Yes, but she wasn't sharing these. Not at this point. Right. Those come out later, but she was bulimic Yes. in high school, and she had some thoughts of suicide. Well, she seemed to have been a real perfectionist, not able yeah. to deal with any kind of failure. But I can certainly see her her kind of breakdown at this point. There's four kids. She's at home alone with them all day long. She's breastfeeding one. She's got three toddlers Yes. that she's caring for. They live in this 350-square-foot mobile home. That Those, would be that's hard a, on anyone. a recipe for disaster. Yeah. So, But she was very tearful and ashamed for taking the overdose. In notes from a joint counseling session with Andrea and Rusty, the social worker wrote that Andrea was unwilling or unable to identify any recent life stressors. Well, geez, all you got to do is look at what's going on. You can figure out the stressors. Well, sure, but she wasn't a complainer at all. Well, you don't have to complain. I mean, you just have to s state the story. I'm, well, I, I'm a I don't stay think at home was... mom with four kids, and I live in this 350 square foot home. Sure, but I don't think she was one to do that. I don't think that she would, and as Rusty had said in one of his statements, she was not able to express her needs. She was all about taking care of others. So she's not going to say, I need time, I need this. No, I know she's not, but if they're taking a history, they, they know. Oh, just from the facts. Right. Sure. You can surmise pretty easily. I could see that, yeah, you're right. So Rusty was aware of Andrea's disease, and he is accepting it. Uh, but he was more comfortable calling it postpartum depression than a major depression. Well, yeah, I think he was looking at that as situational. When she has a baby, she gets depressed and stuff, but we medicate right. her, she gets better. And that's the way he wanted to see that's, it. That's what he wanted. Yes. But at this point, Andrea was nearly mute and uh, advancing on her way to catatonia. The social worker, Norma Torek, seemed to be the only professional who was very concerned about a patient as sick as Andrea who was going to be released from the hospital. She even called Houston's Child Protective Services about the family's unusual living conditions. She told them also that the three-year-old son, the third one, or was it the second one, one of the kids, was allowed to use a power drill, I hope under supervision. <laughs> I <laughs> yeah. shouldn't, shouldn't laugh at that. No, that's, that could be dangerous, sure. 
So a week later, uh, Houston Child Protective Services responded that there didn't seem to be any substantial risk or for abuse, and no further inquiries would be made. They also suggested that any further concerns should be directed to the Houston Police Department. So that's passing the buck. Yeah, there was a lot of passing the buck, a lot of falling through the cracks going on. So home they go. She's on Zoloft, starting her dose. Okay. Now, just a side note, Zoloft is an antidepressant. It's in the class of drugs called an SSRI, which stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. So all that gobbledygook means is that you increase your brain levels of serotonin um, by taking Zoloft. And serotonin is thought to play a role in depression. So if you increase the amount of serotonin, you come out of depression. That's the idea. Interestingly, there's no study that supports any of that stuff. Really? Really. So where do they get the idea to use it? Just Just magic. (laughs) <laughs> just uh, on-the-job trials, Yeah. just seeing what works, which seems to be a lot with uh, psychotropic medication is yeah, cause there's, kind there's of just no, see what works for each, each person. There's nothing you can measure, right? There's no objective measurement other than does the patient get better or do they not get better. Right. But then if she was diagnosed with depression but actually had bipolar or manic depression, an antidepressant isn't going to help it, her long term. It's not going to help at all. And it's not going to help with psychosis either. Right. Right. So anyway, home they go. She's on her Zoloft. Three weeks later, she's found holding a knife to her throat in the bathroom of her parents' home, and she's begging Rusty to let her die. Yeah. So it didn't seem or doesn't seem like the antidepressant was helping her too much. No, but she's having some religious delusions. Is that an okay way to put it? I think so. From things or, that are being fed to her by the Warnikis, at I least mean, partially. Psychotic thoughts would be another way of putting it. Yes, right. But I think you can have psychotic thoughts and then ideas can be put in your head that can flourish in that environment. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So it can be a combination of things. Or another way of putting it is that the Warnickies were preying on a vulnerable person. Yeah. Or yeah. is that too strong? No, I think that even Rusty might agree with that. Yeah. I don't know what they were getting from it. Well, they thought they were doing God's work. So you think they really believe that? Oh, yeah. Okay. I think he's one of these fanatics that has those beliefs. Okay. Well, she hadn't been taking her medication, and she was refusing to feed the children because she said she thought they were eating too much. She thought there were video cameras in the ceilings and said that characters on the television on the television were talking to her and the children. She told Rusty about her hallucinations, but neither of them told the psychiatrist. Now, Rusty drove Andrea to the emergency room after she'd held the knife to her throat, and she was admitted to another hospital and saw a new psychiatrist, Dr. Starbranch. Now, she'd been inconsistently taking the Zoloft that Dr. Fleck had prescribed, and she flushed the Zyprexa down the toilet when she learned that Zyprexa is an antipsychotic. So So she was on both Zoloft and Zyprexa. She was on the Zoloft from the hospital, and then the doctor had put her on the Zyprexa, which she found out was an antipsychotic and flushed down the toilet, apparently. Right. Now you want to hear about Zyprexa? Yeah, what is Zyprexa? Is an antipsychotic, of course. It and is. The, the generic is olanzapine, and Zyprexa is the brand name. It's what's called an atypical antipsychotic, which in the nomenclature of medications, that means it's second generation. So it's not a first-line antipsychotic or, or an old-time antipsychotic. It's a newer antipsychotic. Okay. Used in the treatment of schizophrenia, and it is a dopamine antagonist. So we're, we're having all sorts of lessons on brain chemicals. <laughs> and So what does a dopamine antagonist do? So it reduces the levels of dopamine, which is supposed to help reduce the psychotic thoughts. Okay. Okay. Does it work with the Zoloft in any way? It can. Okay. Now, the biggest side effect of Zyprexa and, and all the atypicals is weight gain. Okay. People. Well, and with Zoloft also, right? A little bit. Okay. I mean, not so much. Okay. But the major side effect of Zoloft is 
other GI effects, gastrointestinal effects, and uh, a blunting of the, the sexual desires. Yeah, a lot of antidepressants have that, don't they? Right. Right. But Zyprexa, I mean, people eat like horses. Okay. And can gain a fair amount of weight. Which you, wouldn't have hurt her because she was no, quite thin. She, well. She hadn't been eating or sleeping. She hadn't been eating. She's nursing a kid. And she's got three other kids running around the house. I mean, no wonder she's losing weight. Right. The the other kind of side effect of Zyprexa and other of the atypicals is that sometimes they have a paradoxical effect, and it makes you crazier. Oh no! But I can I can kind of see why she didn't want to take an antipsychotic, even though it was prescribed to her. Well, I mean, she probably believed that she wasn't psychotic for one thing. Probably, but yes. she also probably didn't want to have all the side effects that could be associated with it. Sure. You think maybe her perfectionism would frown on any weight gain? Absolutely. Yeah, because she normally was quite trim. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I think the, the overriding thing is that she didn't think she needed to be on that medication. Right, which isn't uncommon at all. No. No. Well, she'd also been self-mutilating, digging some deep scratches on her scalp, her arms, and her legs. And upon her admission, she was basically mute, very suicidal, and psychotic. So Andrea said she'd had an image of a knife in her head and heard a voice that said, get a knife, get a knife, over and over. And she'd had the vision about 10 times over the past few days. And it was then that she revealed that she'd had her first vision actually when Noah, their oldest child, was a newborn. But at that point it had gone away and she didn't tell anyone. So there's a history here. This, this isn't just new onset. This is something that's been going on or, or has occurred Yeah, but occurred she's been kind before. of able to cover up before. Yeah. And now she's not able to do that. But I think what you're, what you're demonstrating is that there's a, a fairly substantial history of psychiatric illness in this woman. Yes. Yes. And it's not just something that occurred after the birth of her fourth child. Well, no. I mean, after the tragedy and everything happened, looking back, there was, there was quite a family history as well that hadn't been acknowledged. So, and Andrea also acknowledged obsessive thoughts over her children and how the children would turn out. She wanted to train them correctly, but was afraid she would fail. And that's that's a setup for failure anyway. Well, yeah, and this was yeah. definitely being fed by the Warnikis. Oh, absolutely. Now, there had been the falling out, as we mentioned, between Rusty and Michael Warnicki. So Andrea no longer talked to Rusty about salvation. Although it was something that weighed heavily on her mind. Right. And here she is back in the hospital again, but this time with a diagnosis of major depressive disorder with psychotic features, and it was recurrent because it's happened again. She suffered from postpartum psychosis, and the visual hallucinations made schizophrenia a diagnosis to rule out. So postpartum psychosis is a pretty rare disease. Yes, I mean, if, if much you, more rare than postpartum depression, Yeah, which and, is quite common. And postpartum depression is much rarer than just feeling kind of blue after yeah. the baby's born. So you have like baby blues, postpartum depression, postpartum psychosis. Postpartum psychosis is pretty rare. But you must have seen plenty of mothers with postpartum depression in your career. I've seen plenty of mothers with postpartum depression. And fortunately, I've only seen one mother with postpartum psychosis. Well, that's that's unusual that you've only seen one. Well, that you know of, I, I guess. That I know of. Right. This this happened years ago. I got a phone call one night when I was on call from the husband of the the mom, and the baby was about three weeks old, and the husband was calling because his wife was hallucinating that there were aliens outside the door that were coming to take her baby away. How scary would that be that for, for her and for him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I only said, go to the hospital, you know, call, call the ambulance. They did. Yeah, don't mess around. Just call 911. Right. She, because at she, that point. Yeah. She got admitted, was treated, came out of it, and seemed to be doing okay. Afterwards, she was on medication, of course. And then I moved to Maine and lost touch. So I don't know if if they had more kids or what. 
it was a scary thing. I mean, at that point, do they normally recommend that they don't have more children? Well, if, if you've had an episode of postpartum psychosis, there's a huge risk of happening again. Yeah, it's like almost 50%, isn't it? Yes, close to. Yeah. So I don't know that it's necessarily a statement of do not have more kids, but you certainly have to give them the odds or the probability that it could happen again. To be prepared. Right. But probably if they've had four kids, you'd say, maybe you should stop. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in More the, likely than if they'd had one kid, you're going to tell them to stop. That's all I'm saying. I know. But in, in this case, they, the Yateses were told not to have more kids. Because she had a pretty severe case. She Well, she's catatonic. Yes. She's, I mean, I don't know what the percentage of women that end up in that condition are, but I would imagine it's even lower. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Way. Yeah. And they do say that postpartum psychosis is life-threatening to the mother and the child. It can be. I mean, if, Absolutely. if you're in the grips of psychosis, you might harm yourself or harm the infant. Well, and it's a situation where you're alone with a, a helpless infant, right? which makes it really scary, yeah. really threatening, yeah. So during the admission, Dr. Starbranch, her new psychiatrist, had her consulted Dr. Arturo Rios, who was a psychiatrist who specialized in electroconvulsive therapy. Okay. Shock treatment. Right, which has been proven pretty effective for depression. Right. It's not like the shock treatments of cuckoo's nest days. No, it's not like you see on TV and stuff. So Dr. Rios recommended the treatment for her, but both Andrea and Rusty were against it. So instead, she was prescribed an antipsychotic drug mixture of Haldol and Cogentin. And this is pretty extreme, right? This it, isn't this, the usual. This is extreme. Well, she'd already kind of tried the Zyprexa. I mean, she didn't take it very long. But the advantage of Haldol is it can be given intramuscularly, and you can do it in a dose that's only once a month. So, oh, yeah. So that gets you out of worrying about taking it on a daily basis orally. Compliance. Yes. So Haldol is a first-line antipsychotic. So Haldol's been around a long time. Long time. And it has a bad rep. It does, because it has some really nasty side effects. But again, it, it can be given intramuscularly, so you don't have to worry about compliance, as long as you can get the person into your office once a month, or have right. visiting nurses visit them once a month to administer it. Sure. But the major side effect of Haldol, or Haloperidol is the generic, is a thing called tardive dyskinesia, which is a disorder that results in involuntary repetitive body movements, kind of like twitches and stuff. And it can be permanent. So you, you might have cured the psychosis, but you're left with this motor disorder that's equally as debilitating. And the reason for using the cogentin, which in its generic form is benzotropine. And what kind of drug is that? It's a drug that's used for movement disorders. So it's basically to counteract the effects or the possible side effects of Haldol. But is it going to stop permanent damage from the hell, though? Hopefully. Okay. It can do that. It can do that. Okay. But not always. Right, And, and right. It's, it's not like a guarantee that if you take the cogentin with the hell, doll, you're going to obviate the side effects. You still can have the side effects. And I think she she showed some of these eventually. So. Like? Well, the foot tapping. Okay. What was the the mask face thing? What drug gives you that, a mask-like face? Well, the cogentin could do that because it... Because it relaxes muscles or well, it, am I oversimplifying? A little bit. Okay. But it, and cogentin might be used sometimes in treatment of Parkinson's disease. Okay. So that's where the mask-like face comes in. Okay. But it's, you know, neither of these are good drugs overall. Right. But it seemed to be the only thing that was working for her. But it, they worked, right? right? Right. And when it's life or death, maybe it was worth using. I don't know. That's part of the controversy of her treatment. Right. Right. Well, Al although we'll find out that she eventually ended up on the correct medication and it worked. But we'll save that for later. Okay. Well, Rusty Yates would say that the drug combination of Haldol and Cogentin was miraculous at that point. Yeah. He felt like the old Andrea was back within 24 hours. They spent some time together having a conversation, and he felt like, okay, problem solved. I have her back. Now, Rusty visited Andrea 
in the psych ward daily. So he was a very devoted husband. We have to give him that. He would bring the kids to see her. He would encourage her to eat. He'd give her like insure to drink because she was really losing weight, not eating. Um, encouraged her to take her medications. He brought her flowers and gifts. And he would actually complain to staff if he thought she needed a bath or some kind of care that she wasn't getting. So after 19 days, Andrea was discharged to a partial hospitalization program where she would spend 11 days there while sleeping at her home at night. So, so she was a day patient. Yeah, basically. So Rusty had bought a three-bedroom house in Clear Lake, Texas. He and his mother-in-law thought this would be better for them to get into a home and not get out of that bus, which well, was smart, I wouldn't think. Wouldn't you think? I would think that would help. I mean, the bus was still there at the home. Oh, was it? Yeah. Yeah. He had to pour a big pad of concrete to support the bus. Really? Yeah. So they, they had the bus just in case they needed it or something. <laughs> okay. Well, they'd spent like $15,000 on it or something. Yeah. They'd kind of gotten ripped off on it, it seems like. They did. But now they're in Clear Lake, where all the NASA people work. Right. Because it's close by. Yep. Well, at her first post-hospital visit with the psychiatrist, Dr. Starbranch, she told Andrea to make sure to remain compliant with her medications, even though she felt better. And on her next visit in August of 1999, Andrea told the doctor that she wanted to get off all of her medications and that she wanted to get pregnant again. And she warned the Yates that having another baby would likely bring on more episodes of psychotic behavior. So that wasn't recommended. <laughs> Far from it. Right. And, you know, coming off medication, again, I know this is a common thing. Yes. Right? You, you get on the medicine, you feel better, and you say, I don't need it anymore. I've done that with antibiotics. Right. It's, it's just human nature. So that August, Dr. Starbranch wrote, Apparently, patient and husband plan to have as many babies as nature will allow. This will surely guarantee future psychotic depression. And she's definitely right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, speaking of things that are right, Dickie, I'd like to just take a minute here to talk about our sponsor. Okay. Let's talk about HelloFresh. Yeah. Do you know what you're having for dinner tonight? Well, we do. We're having the Faro Bowl, right? We are. Yep. Because we use HelloFresh. Now, HelloFresh makes healthy eating easier, tastier, and a lot more fun for us. HelloFresh creates new delicious recipes. It has step-by-step -step instructions with pictures to make eating at home convenient and enjoyable. Now, the recipes are designed to take about 30 minutes and can work easily for experts in the kitchen like you or <laughs> eager novices such as myself. Right. We've had good luck with it. We have. HelloFresh sources the freshest ingredients, measures the exact quantities needed, and delivers it all fresh to our doorstep. They even have two registered dietitians on staff who go over each recipe to make sure it's good for us. And we actually had HelloFresh last night. We did. I, I made the tortilla soup. Delicious. It was excellent. And I would only emphasize again the ease of preparation, the deliciousness of the meal, the healthiness of the meal. Can I just add, we order the meal for two people, and our youngest son was home from college and ate with us, and we still had leftovers, and, and he's 20. He can eat. He did. So they're definitely generous portions. They are. So you can order, like Dick said, the classic box, the veggie box, or the family box, and it really saves Dick the planning and the grocery trip, but it also allows us to keep having these delicious home-cooked meals together. I mean, the, the nice thing is... You've got these great tasting meals, and half my week is taken up. Yeah, you love so that, don't you? So I don't you? have to plan much more, Yeah. other so. than saying, which meal do you want to try tonight? So your face always lights up if you come home from work and that box is sitting on the doorstep. I tell you, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so be like Dickie and say, hello, Fresh. Exactly. <laughs> and try hello, Fresh. I mean, trust us, it is fun, it's easy, it's fresh, it's yummy. And when the package arrives at our door, it's in this stay fresh, recyclable, which is really important packaging. And I, I can only emphasize once more that there's two dietitians that supervise the meals. So not only is it easy to prepare and delicious, it's nutritious, delicious yes. and nutritious. And good for the earth because we're not wasting and we're recycling. That's right. So for $35 off your first delivery, just go to HelloFresh.com and enter our special promo code for you, TCB. There's no obligation either, so you'll be really glad you did it. By March of 2000, Andrea Yates was pregnant again. 
and she was homeschooling Noah and taking care of the other three boys who were toddlers. Now she continued her monthly appointments with her psychiatrist, Dr. Starbranch. But she's on no meds now, right? Right, which is, yeah. There's a recipe for disaster lurking here. Kind of, yeah. So at her January 2000 visit, Andrea did admit that she'd been off her meds since November of 1999, and she wanted to be off the meds unless she became symptomatic, and Rusty agreed with this. Well, yeah. I mean, I can see they're thinking, kind of. Can you? Yeah. It's okay. misguided, but they, they're thinking, well, this stuff really works so well. If I need it again, we'll just put her back on it, and it'll work again. Right. Right? That's, yeah. That's the thinking. Yes. Right. They thought that if it happens, we have the solution, right. we'll deal with it. Yeah. Which it really isn't all that simple. Well, it is a definite oversimplification of things. Yes. And Andrea's really kind of reluctant to follow the treatment plans. So this was the last time that the Yates would go to see Dr. Starbranch. Well, yeah. They don't need her anymore, right? That's what they think, yeah. Yeah. Now that winter, Andrea confided to her old friend, Debbie Holmes, that she thought she was possessed. She said Satan was the source of her breakdown by influencing and possessing her. She said she wasn't able to wear her crucifix and that she had thoughts about hurting someone or some harm coming to her kids. Man, how would you like to be that friend and hear that story? I'd be so worried. No kidding. I know. And I wonder, I mean, it's easy to judge why didn't she do something. I don't know what you can do when you're just a friend, but I would think there would be something. Now, Andrea gave birth to her daughter Mary on November 30th in 2000, and it was less than four months later that Andrew Kennedy Sr., Andrea's dad, died. He'd suffered from Alzheimer's disease for about seven years, and he'd spent the last six months in a wheelchair. Now, Andrea had really adored him, and it was a big loss for her. Not surprisingly, I mean, it is her dad, and they were very close from what people say that knew them. Yeah, it was a tough loss for her. Well, combined with the fact that she just given birth to her fifth child and she has these psychiatric issues, definitely it was tough. Huh. Doesn't begin to describe it. No, no. And by the time her father's funeral came around, Andrew is showing symptoms of a serious mental illness. At the end of March 2001, she looked like a zombie. And that's a quote from her husband. She picked at her scalp until it bled. And the book we read said that she thought that it had the mark of uh, the devil, 666, on her scalp, and she's trying to pick that off. Yeah, she has these delusions. She obsessively held the baby, Mary, and refused to put her down. She wasn't eating, she wasn't sleeping, she didn't speak much at all, and she's having hallucinations. This woman's seriously ill. Seriously ill and the primary caretaker for five Right. vulnerable, dependent children. Yes. It's really a terrible situation that nobody should be in. And she's just lost her father. Yes. So Rusty called Dr. Starbranch, their former psychiatrist. She recommended inpatient treatment. Well, of course. But the hospital and the doctor's office was 45 minutes away. With work, five children, a mother-in-law in mourning, the commute seemed impossible. So Rusty scheduled an office appointment for Andrea on April 2nd. He called several local psychiatrists on March 28th or 29th to see if they could prescribe Andrea's medicine over the phone. Well, that's not going to fly, but anyway. Okay, but just thinking of that, can I just say, there's seriously, there are just serious problems with our health care, you know, especially with mental health care. Oh, there's no question. Maybe he shouldn't have expected that to happen, but there should have been other resources, well, and they just aren't. The, the end of that was um, they, they wouldn't prescribe over the phone. They wanted to see her first, yeah, but, but, but they had no openings. Right. So what good does that do you? Right, exactly. And that's, that's the problem. Yep. I mean, you've seen kids spend weeks in the ER waiting for placement for psychiatric issues. There's just a big problem, and I don't claim to have any solution. I'm just saying there's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on March 30th, Rusty called the nearby Devereaux, Texas Treatment Network, and he planned to bring Andrea in for admission the next day. So the next day, Rusty and Andrea's brother, Brian, took Andrea to be admitted. So Rusty gave them Andrea's medical history, and he described her recent symptoms. Now, Andrea, she refused to sign a consent form to be treated, and it was not until 3 p.m. at the hospital's suggestion 
that Sergeant Josette Boudot made an application to Galveston County Probate Court to have her detained without a warrant for perimen- preliminary examination. So the application stated that she needed inpatient stabilization for the safety of herself and for others. So that's good that they did that. Yeah, so this was an involuntary commitment. Basically, basically. yeah. So the next day, Andrea seemed worse, and hospital progress reports said that she could only speak three to four word sentences, and that took great effort on her part. And the longest sentence she used that day was really scary. She said, I am not a good mother. So that's yeah. just really gives us, looking well, back, it's it's horrifying. Hi- hindsight, think. yes. Horrifying, yeah. So on April 4th, Rusty, Andrea's mother, and the five children visited Andrea. Now, the group therapy sessions she attended were for alcohol and drug addiction. Yeah, not not for her mental illness. No, they didn't have anything available for her illness or even depression. Right. And Devereaux was a hospital that was designed for treatment of drug and alcohol problems. Primarily, yes. So, not the best fit. No. On April 10th, Andrea's chart showed that she was making great progress. She was feeding herself and that she said she felt 90% better. Now, she denied suicidal thoughts at this point as well. So when Rusty visited and learned that they were planning for discharge, he was really shocked. To him, Andrea looked like she was still the sickest patient there. But Andrea agreed to attend the post-hospitalization program again, and she was discharged on April 12th. Well, and she was discharged because there was a time limit. Right. This was right on schedule with her managed care this insurance. This is what the insurance is going to pay for. Right. There's the other big issue. Sure. So, so besides the lack of available psychiatric help, you've got these time constraints. You do. And this is reality. This is the way right. that it's working. So Andrea went to the day program the next day, but then she told Rusty that evening when he picked her up that she didn't want to go back because the sessions were for substance abuse patients, which is reasonable. Yeah, it's not her problem. Right. So Rusty called the nurse who admitted Andrea to Devereaux to tell him that Andrea was leaving the outpatient program. So not surprisingly, Andrea continued to decline, and her effectsor was increased. Rusty had told the doctor that Haldol had worked for Andrea in the past, but he chose to prescribe Risperidol, a newer and preferred drug. But Risperidol hadn't worked before, and it wasn't working this time either. So over the next two weeks, Andrea seemed more and more depressed, and her effects or dose was increased. She also remained on Welbutrin and Risperidol. Do you want to talk a little bit about these medications while we're here? Oh, sure. Okay. So in no particular order, Risperidol or Risperidone is the generic, is an antipsychotic, basically the same side effects as Haldol, and there's also increased risk of suicide with it. So that's one thing she's on. She's also on a Fexor, or which is called venlafaxine. This is an antidepressant. It's not an SSRI like Zoloft. It's a serotonin nor epinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So what's the difference between the two, really? Because I don't know what you mean. So what this one does is that it, besides increasing the amount of serotonin, it will increase the amount of norepinephrine, which is another brain chemical. Which improves the mood? Yes. Okay. And Welbutrin is similar to Effexor in its effects and action. So side effects with them increase risk of suicide. Welbutrin has a risk of seizures. So these aren't necessarily great drugs. but Well, I mean, I think Welbutrin and Effexor can be good for the right person. They, they can be. Sure. Yeah. So, But they weren't helping Andrea. No. So, And she'd already been on... Risperidol before, and it didn't do her do her any good. Right, right. And so they were adjusting doses of the Effexor in an attempt to stabilize her, which wasn't working. Right. Okay. Well, in early May, Andrea was pacing the house, and she was spending hours staring into space. Dora Yates, Rusty's mother, visited, and she was shocked to see Andrea's condition because she hadn't seen her in a while. And Andrea was very withdrawn. She spoke only in monosyllables. She would put out cereal for the children's breakfast, but then she would completely forget about lunch. And then she was readmitted to Devereaux on May 4th. Which 
might not have been the best thing, right? Well, I think that's the place that's closest. It's closest. It's one of the few affordable psychiatric inpatient centers in the Houston area. Mm -hmm. However, Rusty didn't know about the many complaints that were made against Devro yeah, with those the were... Department of Health and Human Services. Right, right. So they found that in uh, three of 11 records reviewed, psychosocial evaluations were performed by unqualified mental health workers. So not good there. One of every eight charts, there was no psych evaluation. One patient who had been an inpatient there had hung himself with a bed sheet while on suicide watch, and he had been dead for at least five hours before his body was found. Well, there's some negligence for so, you. So not a good suicide watch. Absolutely, yeah. Her new psychiatrist, Dr. Saeed, didn't contact Dr. Starbranch, her former psychiatrist, about Andrea's care. Risperdal hadn't worked, so he gave in and started Andrea back on the Haldol. When, when he went, when Rusty went to visit her in mid-May, she's standing at the door with her bag packed. Another surprise. Another surprise, but time to leave. This is all your insurance is going to pay for. She was again referred to the partial hospitalization program, uh, still for the same chemical dependency stuff. Yeah. So. It's really no help We're at just all. Just going around in a circle. It's kind of just kind of a place to put her during the day, right? Yeah. Not really she's, helping her. She's not at home and she's not in the hospital. She's an outpatient. Yeah. Yeah. Big, well, when, big deal. When Rusty picked Andrea up at the end of her first day, she complained that there'd been only one session the whole day and it had focused on substance abuse. So Rusty inquired with the nurse about the sessions for his wife and he was told, well, you'll just need to file a complaint. There's nothing the nurse could do. So after her discharge, Andrea saw her psychiatrist once in May and then twice that June. On her June 4th appointment, a decision was made to taper off her Haldol. Now later, the doctor would testify that there was no definite indication of psychosis and that he had considered the Haldol might have been hindering her progress from the antidepressant medications. Now this was because some of the side effects of Haldol could resemble depression symptoms, with the masked facial expressions and the slowed body movements. So Rusty had been giving Andrea her 2 milligrams of Haldol in the morning and another 2 milligrams in the evening, and the new orders were to drop the morning dose for 3 days and then go ahead and drop the evening dose altogether so she's off the Haldol. Okay, so what's the backup plan? What are they going to put her on instead of Haldol? Nothing? Just the Risperidol. So that's going to be the, the one drug that's going to manage her psychotic tendencies. Yeah, but at this point he's saying he doesn't really see psychosis as her major problem. Then why is she on an antipsychotic? See, I'm, I'm not terribly impressed with Dr. Saeed. I at know least, you're not. Yeah. At least from what I've read. I mean, first of all, he, he takes forever to contact a previous psychiatrist. I mean, that's, that's the first thing you do, is talk to the, the previous physician. And then, while he doesn't think she's psychotic and he's weaning her off the Haldol, he's going to keep her on another antipsychotic drug. What, what's with that? Well, I'm wondering if he's actually having meetings with her or just meeting with her and Rusty. And another thing is, a lot of psychiatrists don't really do talk therapy. They just meet and talk about how the meds are working. Right. So sh is she not getting any talk therapy? Which yeah. I think she needed real therapy as well she as did. medications. And, which... and most psychiatrists are medication people. It has turned that way, hasn't it? And if, if you need talk therapy, you need to talk to a social worker or a, a counselor or something. Well, I don't think she was getting that. No, she wasn't. So that's not good. I mean, usually if someone can meet and talk with a social worker and then the social worker can consult with the psychiatrist... And then the patient meets with the psychiatrist once a month or so. You're getting better coverage. Exactly. This feels like there wasn't enough coverage, obviously. There wasn't. No. Well, after stopping the hell doll, Andrea improved for a few days, but then she just crashed. Well, what did they expect? Well, at her June 18th psychiatric appointment, Rusty told the doctor that Andrea had declined and that he was really concerned about her. Now, Andrea was denying that she was having psychotic symptoms or feeling suicidal. Now, Dr. Saeed didn't want to restart the Haldol, though. He didn't find any evidence still that the psychosis was playing an important role in her illness. And I guess this would be because she's denying it. So I don't think we can totally blame the doctor for this. 
Okay. Although you're a doctor and you don't think he was doing what he should have, so maybe you're right. Yeah, I can. I guess I can sort of see if, if she's denying all these symptoms, then maybe he thinks that psychosis wasn't a primary factor. Maybe she may have been hiding it. But I don't see how you can hide it that effectively. Well, and, no, and, I, and she I don't looked think, so bad on right. the 20th and the 21st when this happened. She looked like shit. Yeah, and I don't think a, a good physician could miss those symptoms. You're right. And Rusty had concerns. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'm done bashing Dr. Saeed. Well, then he had her on Remeron. What's Remeron? Remeron is a, another antidepressant. It's what's called the second generation. Mirtazapine is its generic name. It acts kind of like Effexor and Wellbutrin in that it's increasing serotonin and norepinephrine activity. So, you know, I'm not sure if, if you've been using Effexor and you've been using Wellbutrin and they haven't produced results, I'm not sure why you'd use Remeron because it's a similar drug. Well, he increased her dose of Remeron at that point. Yeah. So, and, and Remeron is going to make you sleepy and it's going to make you gain weight. Okay. Which the weight gain probably wouldn't be bad. Sleepy. No, she looked skeletal. Sleepy wouldn't be so good with five kids running around. Well, I mean, I'm thinking she had help, I hope, most of the time. Well, Rusty's mother was down there. Obviously not enough, but she no. was there. No. The physician also said that Andrea needed to help him out with a more positive attitude, and that totally rubs me the wrong way. You blame the patient. But I could see, I could see, I could see him saying that, right? What? Doctors sometimes say things like that. Doctors can be jerks. Almost like you know, he's tired of worrying about it. He's tired of. She's kind of a pain in the ass. Right. Right. And and he's saying you got to take some responsibility for this. You got to be more positive. Yeah, and this is back before we knew this tragedy was happening. So he doesn't understand what the huge, how bad it's going to be. No. So he's telling her, you need to help me out with a more positive attitude, which I don't like. That is a, a douchebag thing no. to say. Well, again, that's blaming the patient for being sick. Right, because he doesn't have the solution. Right. So after they left that appointment, though, it was very telling that Andrea told Rusty she thought that Dr. Saeed was just sick of seeing her face. That's probably the most prescient remark she could make. Yeah, pretty insightful. Yeah. So Andrea was on this really high dose of Effexor, 450 milligrams. Super high, right? That's a ton. Yeah. Holy cow. And when her depression failed to improve, her dose was lowered to 300 milligrams, but it wasn't tapered down as was recommended by the pharmaceutical company. Yeah, you're supposed to make a, a long taper. Taper it down, but she went right from 450 to 300. Yeah. Like, boom. And I don't know how significant that is, but it's something that happened, so I thought I'd mention it. Now, psychiatrists called the combination of the medications she was on, Effexor and Remeron, rocket fuel. Well, yeah. Basically, you're doubling down on the meds. Yeah. So. And what are the side effects of being on those two? I mean, I know Effexor can make people a little bit crazy, a little bit aggressive, can it? Yeah, you can be pretty irritable, aggressive, grouchy, whatever. There's a risk of suicide with the Effexor. The Remeron has a slightly different profile. It's more weight gain and sleepiness. So it's kind of supposed to counteract. So maybe it's supposed to counteract some of the effects of the Effexor. I don't know. I'm not a psychiatrist, as people can probably recognize. But you do have patients on these drugs, so you have a little bit of insight. A little bit. Now, on June 20th, Andrea had been without antipsychotic medication for more than two weeks. And that morning, Rusty had given her a 300-milligram dose of her Effexor. And when he left for work, she was sitting at the kitchen table eating corn pops out of the box. His mother was due at the house to watch the kids between 10 and 10.30. And a little before 10 a.m., Rusty's cell phone rang at his work in the engineering office at NASA. And it was Andrea calling. So Andrea said, you need to come home. And Rusty said, what's wrong? And Andrea said, it's time. Rusty said, what do you mean? And Andrea said, it's time. So Rusty, noticing her tone and that there's a problem here, you know, he's her husband, he knows, left the office telling a co-worker that he had a family emergency, and he left in a big hurry. Well, that's an ominous sounding phone call from her. Absolutely. Isn't it? Yes. It's time. Yeah. Yeah. 
So he hurried out of the building to his car, and he called his mother on his way. His mother, Dora, had come from Tennessee to help with the children when Andrea first became sick after Mary was born. And she hadn't left her hotel yet when she got Rusty's call, though. And Rusty said, hurry, something's wrong at the house. And then he called Andrea back. And this is really ominous, because he asked her, is anybody hurt? And she said, yes. And he said, who? And she said, the kids. And he said, which ones? And she said, all of them. So at this point, his heart just stops. No you kidding. Know, terrible. Now, before Andrea had called Rusty, though, she had called 911 and said she needed a police officer. Yeah, we, we heard that tape. I mean, that's... Yeah. We, she sounds so stoic, so almost robotic. Robotic was the word I'd use. Yeah. And they're trying to, you know, what, is it a medical emergency? Why? Yeah, and she, they th even thought maybe someone was there yeah, threatening her yeah. because she wouldn't talk really. Right. Yeah. But they did send somebody. They did. Officer David Knapp was dispatched to the Yates house to do a welfare check because she did tell the 911 operator that she had five children. That was enough to make the operator concerned. And when he got there, Andrea met him at the front door. Her clothing was wet, and her long, dark hair was hanging in her face. She looked kind of flush. She was breathing heavily. She just looked terrible. And he said to her, what do you need a police officer for? And she just came out and told him, I just killed my kids. This guy, I can't imagine. Now, she told him the kids were in the bed, and she motioned him into the house. I don't know if I could go in. It's just terrifying. It would be tough, wouldn't it? It would be. Just This is something that these people that responded will never forget. Not ever. No. In the master bedroom, there was a king-size mattress and box spring on the floor. And Officer Knapp noticed a small child's arm sticking out from under the, the sheet. The arm was very pale, and it, it ended up being Luke's arm. There were four lumps in the bed, and when he pulled back the covers, he saw four young children. One was just a baby, that was Mary, and her little head was lying on one of her brother's arms. He checked each child for any signs of life, and of course there was none. So then Officer Frank Stumpo arrived next, and he found Officer Knapp sitting in the living room with Andrea. And in the guest bathroom tub, he found the fifth child, and that was seven-year-old Noah. And he was floating face down in the tub, and he was also deceased. Now Andrea was sitting on the love seat with Officer Knapp beside her. It had only been about nine minutes since Knapp arrived when Sergeant David Svan showed up. And this was in response to a code one that was called out to him by the other two officers. Stumpo met the sergeant at the front door and told him she killed her kids right off the bat. So Svan had Stumpo arrest and handcuff Andrea. And then he did a walkthrough of the home, which was now a crime scene, obviously. Other officers had arrived and were putting crime scene tape around the house. And then Svan heard Rusty screaming outside when Rusty got home. And he was crying out, what did she do to my kids? So Svan was the one who had to go out and tell Rusty that all five of his children had died. Tough. Can't even imagine. And he fell to the ground just totally grief-stricken by this news. This is just a, a horrifying scene. Oh, I can't even comprehend. No. So Rusty wanted to see his kids. He wanted to talk to Andrea. He was hoping this would be a mistake or a bad dream. Yeah, he'd actually hoped that the older one had spent the night with um, yeah. Andrea's mother, which I guess once in a while he did. He did. Just hoping against hope that he had one child left alive. Isn't that just... Yeah. He, to him, it was inconceivable that his five young children were gone, but the police wouldn't let him in. The house is a crime scene. Yeah, they they really can't. So through a window, Rusty could see Andrea on the love seat. And he yelled through the glass, How could you do this? I don't understand. Well, nobody would. Rusty's mother arrived and tried to comfort him as she dealt with her own grief and shock. Because she's probably feeling guilty that she should have been there. Oh, so much guilt there, I'm sure. If she'd just been there. Yeah, it's horrible for everybody. <laughs> Andrea was taken out the back of the house to the police station. In the interview room, she was very stoic. She explained how she filled the tub the intention of drowning her children. When asked how long she'd been having thoughts about this, she said, probably since I 
realized I have not been a good mother. And this idea, I believe, was planted in her head by Warniki. It was. Yeah. And I almost feel, well, not even almost, I do feel like there should be some responsibility held to, to him for filling her head with this crap. I would wish that he could be charged somehow. I do, too. So she said that the children weren't developing properly, and according to Andrea, she drowned her three-year-old Paul first. She said that he struggled for a couple of minutes, and she actually held him face down in the water. Then she took him out of the water and laid him in the bed, covered him up, and then she put him face up on the bed with the sheet covering him completely. Then she drowned John, then Luke, putting them in the bed with Paul. She said this whole time Mary was crying. So Mary's that baby sitting there crying as she's drowning these other children. So then she grabbed Mary and drowned her. She said she left Mary in the tub and called Noah in. Noah came in and asked her what's wrong with Mary. And she tells Noah to get in the tub. So when he sees Mary and his mom tells him to get in the tub, the poor little guy, he tries to run away. Well, yeah. Just terrifying. And Andrea catches him, though, before he can get out of the bathroom. And she said that he was able to lift his head out of the water a couple of times because he was the biggest one. Yeah. But she was persistent, and she ended up drowning him. Now all of her children she had killed. It's just terrible. Andrea said she realized she needed to be punished for not being a good mother. If she drowned the children, then they would go to heaven because they were still innocent and the criminal justice system would punish her. Well, that's one way of looking at it. Well, this is her delusion, which she probably really believed. Yeah. Yeah. At the house, Rusty and Dory Yates waited for the children to be brought out of the house. Rusty spent the night at the hotel with his mother and his brother Randy, who had flown in from Tampa. Dr. Saeed called Rusty that night, and he said, Is this happening? He asked. I asked her about suicide, but not this. Magellan Health Services, who handled the psychiatric claims for Blue Cross Blue Shield, had a response. Had a representative call Rusty. The rep asked if there was anything the company could do. It's a little too late, right? Right. Barn door is open. Yeah. So the concerns of the doctor and insurance rep were too late to do any good. Well, yeah. Yeah. I guess. So Andrea, she was admitted to the psychiatric unit of the jail. And the on-call doctor didn't know what medications she'd been on, so she just ordered two milligrams of Ativan every six hours for her. Every six hours for her. So Ativan, relaxant, what would you call it? Anti-anxiety. Yeah. Lorazepam. Yeah, so that was just to kind of keep her calm. and. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a quickie fix. Right. It's not something you're going to stay on long term. No. At 1.30 a.m. on June 21st, Andrea went before a magistrate who found probable cause for further detention, and they held her without bond. She was put into an isolation cell naked on a suicide watch, and she remained awake all night. Now, Andrea Andrea requested that her hair be cut in the shape of a crown to see whether she had the number 666, the mark of the beast, on her head. She also wanted to see her husband and a religious person, preferably a Catholic. So when asked how this had yeah, happened... Yeah, but that's, that's just the psychosis talking. Well, yeah. Right. But that's her right. delusion. No. Yeah. So when asked how this had happened by the psychiatrist, Andrea talked about a prophecy, but she wouldn't explain what it was. And she hit her head. And she said, I'm so stupid, couldn't I just have killed Mary to fulfill the pro- prophecy? So that's just weird. That is weird. Why do you think she said that? Kill the girl or kill the youngest? The baby, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well, Dr. Ferguson, the jail's on-call psychiatrist, had seen thousands of patients in her career. Andrea Yates, though, she would say, was one of the sickest patients she had ever seen. And sickest as in mentally ill sick. Yes. Not physically sick. No, but mental illness does have its physical Well, yeah. But I just wanted to... To make people think about the mental illness aspect. Yeah, and too often we don't think of mental illness as a sickness, but it is. It It really is. And this was one of the sickest people she'd ever seen. Right. 
Now that Thursday morning on June 21st, Rusty returned to the house with his mother and his brother. The front lawn now held a memorial with flowers, teddy bears, yellow ribbons, and candles. Now the press was there, and Rusty spoke about Andrea's illness and the loss of his children. Now he was surprisingly calm in this discussion, which irritated a lot of people. This made a lot of people hate him. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't from that aspect a good interview no or a good performance I mean he He didn't come across to a lot of people as being upset enough right but he did seem to have maybe just a better understanding of mental illness than most of us do I don't know I mean it's an opinion thing but there's no question this woman was ill seriously ill yeah so he said you know I've got to remember that she wasn't herself She was thinking irrationally. And a lot of people just wanted him to be angry and hate her. And it irritated them that he didn't. Right. But he recognized her illness. Yeah. Now, Katie Couric called Rusty and offered him help. And he asked her for the name of an attorney for Andrea. So she gave him the name of this, among other attorneys, this George Parnum. And Andrea's family ended up hiring Parnum to represent Andrea. And he's her attorney to this day. Still is. Yeah. He's he's famous in Houston. Yes, he's kind of a big wig. Yeah. He's done a lot of cases. Who else did he do? He did that lady who, the dentist who ran over her husband several times. Harris. Harris, Clara yeah. Harris. But she was convicted. Yeah. But there wasn't much she could do for her. No. That was pretty outright murder. Well, and there's, I mean, there's not too much to do with Andrea. I mean, she confessed to the killings. Well, the thing with Andrea is, is it mental illness or is it murder? Or, right. Well, I guess it's well, murder with mental illness. It's definitely mental but illness. But what is her punishment going to be? Is it going to be prison or hospitalization, basically? Right. Yeah. So although there is expert testimony that Andrea was psychotic, Texas law required that in order to assert the insanity defense, the defendant must prove that she couldn't discern right from wrong at the time the crime was committed. So there's the difficulty. But right from wrong can be more than one thing. She knew it was legally wrong. Right. But in her delusion, she's thinking that it's right. It's the right thing to do. She's trying to save the kids. So, yeah, that's another aspect of it to consider. Well, I know where I am with that. Okay. In March of 2002, the jury rejected the insanity defense and found Andrea guilty. Even though the prosecution had sought the death penalty... The jury refused it, so they got it half right anyway. She was sentenced to life in prison with eligibility for parole in 40 years. Then, three years later, or almost three years later, a Texas Court of Appeals reversed the conviction as a psychiatrist and witness for the prosecution admitted he had given false testimony. Accidentally, not on purpose. He'd given false testimony believing yeah. something that wasn't true. Right. In his testimony, this is Dr. Park Dietz, he said that shortly before the killings, an episode on Law and Order, for which he was an advisor, had aired featuring a woman who drowned her children, and it was acquitted by reason of insanity. And it turns out that there was no such episode. Right. So I don't know why he thought there was. I don't either. If maybe he consulted from one that never aired, I'm not sure. Possibly. But he did come forward to say that it was an error. Yeah, well, he right. did He did that right thing. He did. But I, I don't see how he would even do it to begin with, you know? Well, I mean, it seems I mean, like it's something you'd want to be sure of before you testify. Well, yeah. Yeah. So, so it's strange. It's a, little, it's a little hokey. To me, it's very strange. Yeah. Suzanne O'Malley was covering the trial for, oh, the Oprah magazine, the New York Times magazine, and for NBC News. Now, she had previously been a writer for Law & Order, and she reported that no such episode existed. Now, the appellate court held that the jury may have been influenced by the false testimony, and therefore the new trial was allowed and was deemed to be necessary. Well, I would think so. I mean, this is a, almost a carbon copy case. Yeah, and if you think that she watched that, you're going to think, oh, maybe she's was planning this. Right. Maybe it wasn't an illness. Maybe it wasn't. Now, on January 9, 2006, Andrea again entered pleas of not guilty by reason of insanity, 
and it was on February 1st, 2006, that she was granted release on bail on the condition that she be admitted to a mental health treatment facility. So that July, after three days of deliberations, Andrea was found not guilty by reason of insanity. And then she was committed to the North Texas State Hospital. And in January 2007, she was moved to a low-security state mental hospital in Kerrville, where she's been ever since. And while she's been there, her actual diagnosis was ascertained, right? Oh, I don't know, was it? What did they decide? That she was bipolar. Oh, okay. And they started her on lithium, which is the medication of choice for bipolar disorder. It's kind of an old-fashioned drug, though, but it's it still is. the med of choice? It is. I okay. mean, there's, there's newer versions of it. And guess what? It it's, worked. It's worked. Well, I mean, it's worked, but she's not giving well, birth to babies anymore. She's no, not... I know that. You know, she's but, not living out on the outside. But she's not catatonic, and she's not severely depressed. Sure. So she's more functioning. Yeah. Well, and Rusty actually believes that she should be allowed out. He said he could never trust her to be with her, but that now that she's not having children anymore and she, if she's on the meds, she's really not a risk to society. What so do you he think? says. You don't, You think she's a risk to society? I think she could be. Well, you wouldn't want to let her babysit your children. For, for sure. But she's not really violent to other people. No. No. Well, but Rusty, I doubt uh, that she's getting out. No, it doesn't seem that she will. Now, the thing is that Rusty did end up divorcing her. And I think he divorced her in 2006 before the second trial. Okay. So it was... Oh, no, actually, he divorced her in, around the three-year anniversary of the children's death. Deaths. He decided to divorce her. And he said on his interview with Oprah years later that he decided to go ahead with it because he had been all in with um, Andrea and his kids and that family but he real, finally realized he couldn't have a relationship with Andrea. He could never look at her the same way again or trust her the same way. So he decided to divorce her and move on with his life. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And then he did end up remarrying. So it was about seven years after Andrea had killed the children that he had another baby with his new wife. But he says he still stays in touch with Andrea. So he doesn't blame Andrea at all. He's remarkably forgiving. How do you feel about that? It's hard to accept, isn't it? It even, is. I mean, even if you're looking at this as a mental illness, and it, it wasn't his wife in her right mind who killed the kids. Sure. She, she still killed them. Right, right, which is so, just hard to get over. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I think that the the jury eventually got to the, the right diagnosis. Right, uh, I don't want to say diagnosis. Verdict. Right, verdict. Yeah. Um, she was not guilty by reason of insanity. She's, right. She's clearly mentally ill. And she didn't do it for any other reason. No, I mean, she really had no motive or anger to do it. No. Nope. And it's hard not to hate her. I understand that. Because she did it, a horrible thing. It is. And I just mean, to picture her bringing them in one at a time. She killed five kids. Five. Yeah. It's just really hard not to hate her. But logically thinking, I just think it was her mental illness. Right. Now, Rusty had said that even though it was horribly wrong, it was horribly hurtful to him, his family and everybody, he knew that it was really the illness that caused this and not her, so he doesn't blame her. Which I kind of have to give him credit for that. I don't think I could do it. I think I'd be a lot more angry. But I kind of see I what mean, he's, I yeah, mean, he's being it, reasonable. It's both sides. I mean, I would, I would hate her for killing my kids. Right. But I would recognize that there is a, a factor involved, that she's mentally ill. Well, and, and I'd have a lot of anger at the system and the physicians, wouldn't you? I would have a lot of anger at the psychiatric physicians. I'd have a lot of anger at Warnicki because he... Yeah, that's he, another thing. Yeah, preyed on this woman who had mental issues and fed those issues. So, I mean, to me, he's kind of culpable in this too. I think so. But nothing's going to happen. But there is the other side that says that Rusty's culpable. Why was she left alone with the kids? And that's a good point. Well, 
Yeah, I, I think he thought he had it covered with his mother. Yeah, uh, well, he there, didn't. Although there are gaps in the coverage. Right. And, uh, yeah. I mean, there's, there's enough blame to go around for everybody. Maybe, yeah. It's, it's hard to say, yeah. Well, he does have a, a son now, and he, he did say that he sometimes looks in his son's face and he sees his other children. How can you not? But he also said that he tries to think about their lives and not their death, which I think is a good thing to do. I mean, you can't let their death define who they were. No. Although they didn't live very long. They didn't live they long enough. Yet. Not nearly long enough. Right. Now, in 2014, it was brought up that Andrea might get some day passes and be able to leave the psychiatric facility. But that never did occur. But Rusty was in favor of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why not? Now, do you think we've made any progress in how we deal with postpartum psychosis now? No. Really? <laughs> this should have been at least been a lesson to us. Well, that's an extreme example, right? Yeah, I but, know, but, but still. still. No, we're, we're not any more equipped to deal with it now than we were 15, 16 years ago. Maybe even less so with the health care crisis. You know, well, people don't have coverage. Right. Well, we already know that there's not enough psychiatrists to go around. Absolutely. I mean, in the pediatric realm, there's a real shortage. There's a huge shortage. Yeah. And general pediatric people are doing more and more psychiatric care uh, that we're not really that well trained for. Well, and don't you have don't you have a social worker who actually comes into your office to see people now? We do. To cover. Does that help? That helps tremendously. So that's what I was saying with Andrea is, sure, she had a psychiatrist, but she really should have had somebody to meet with her on a more regular basis, someone, you know, maybe, um, for lack of a better word, a lower level provider. But, yeah, she should have. Yeah. Because nobody was really knowing her, speaking to her on a, on a regular basis. And you could see how the psychiatrist might not have known what was going on with her because he's meeting with her like once a month to talk about medications. Yeah. He's not discussing her everyday feelings. No, not in the least. Right. I mean, you're, you're seeing him once a month, and you're looking at how the medicines are working, and you adjust the meds. Right. This is a woman who could have and should have been seen on a weekly basis by a mental health specialist, and maybe things would have turned out differently. Who knows? Maybe. I think what we could take away from this is that we need to take these things seriously. We do. Right? Like when that lady's husband called, you didn't pussyfoot around. Well, you sent her right to the ER. I was scared. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure her husband was scared. She was probably scared, right? We all were. Yeah, horrible. Okay, well, I think that does it for our discussion. Okay. All right, so as we segue into our feedback segment, we'll listen to a little music, and then we'll chat about some of the feedback we have Okay. coming let's, up, okay? Let's, let's do this. Okay. Okay, welcome to our feedback segment. Before we get rolling on that, I'd just like to remind everyone about Team Tie Grabber. Team Tie Grabber is our members-only club you can join. 
where you get some episodes made only for you. And that began in March with our first members only podcast on Sylvia Likens. And we'll have another one coming up in early April. Also, please get your feedback into us so that we can add it to our feedback segment. And you can do that by emailing truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com or you can go to our website, tiegrabber.com, and click on leave us a voicemail. We'd really love to start playing the feedback in your own voice. So if anybody's up for that, if you've got the courage, just do it because we really would like to have more feedback in our listeners' own voices. We love feedback. Yes. So we're going to get around to our feedback segment now. I just want to remind everyone to go to HelloFresh.com and use the promo code TCB to get $35 off your first week's order. So what have you got for feedback, Dick? Okay, I get to lead off. You do. You're the leading man. So I'm going to talk about Casey Anthony. No, not Casey again. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Jesus Christ, the fucking Casey. Can't ever get rid of her, can we? I think this is probably in response to that judge's comments last week about how he thinks that Casey Uh accidentally killed her daughter with chloroform. Our asshole of the week. Right. Is Casey going to be our asshole this week? Because she's... I think she's a good candidate. She could be the asshole any day. She could. Okay. So the, the... Headline is that she speaks out for the first time on her daughter's death, and the quote is, I sleep pretty good at night. Right. Now, that was sent to us by... This was sent to us by, I don't know. Oh, (laughs) we got it on YouTube from one of our listeners, Eliza. Okay. So, Casey Anthony knows that much of the world believes she killed her two-year-old daughter, despite her acquittal. Sure. But nearly nine years later, she insists she doesn't know how the last hours of Casey's life unfolded. Okay. How could she not? She was with her. Anyway. Well, she's saying she wasn't, apparently. Kaylee would be 12 right now and would be a total badass, she told the Associated Press. And is, what? What does that mean? That's what Casey says. She's so stupid. I'd like to be thinking that she'd listen to classic rock and play sports, putting up with no nonsense. But in discussing Kaylee's last moments, Casey spoke in halting, sober tones. I'm still not even certain as I stand here today about what happened. Give me a fucking break. Okay. I'm sorry. No, I'm with you. Based off what was in the media, I understand the reasons people feel about me. I understand why people have the opinions that they do. Well, good. It's been almost nine years since Kaylee went missing, since since the circus-like Orlando trial that ended in Casey's acquittal. trial was carried on... Cable Networks was the focus of daily commentaries by Nancy Grace, who called her the most hated mom in America and derisively tot mom. Anthony views herself as something of an Alice in Wonderland with the public as the Red Queen. Jeez, oh God. The, The Queen is proclaiming, no, no, sentence first, verdict afterward. I sense and feel to this day that it is a direct parallel to what I lived. My sentence was doled out long before there was a verdict. Sentence first, verdict afterward. People found me guilty long before I had my day in court. Well, I don't have any comment on that. Well, although we think she's guilty, and did she She said she's living with one of the attorneys, right? She is. Yeah, but they said that in the other article we read. Right. Okay. So, again, I think that the only reason for her breaking her silence was because the judge opened his fat mouth to talk about how he thinks that she was killed accidentally. Well, and she loves the attention. Although she's basically living a life of recluse. She is. She's not going to be out and about because people hate her, rightly so. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to appoint her or award her. She is going to get the Asshole of the Week award. Good. Okay. She probably could have won it for the year, but we'll give it to her probably. for the week. Probably. We'll, we'll just do just the week. Coming forth. And if okay. we don't find one next week, we'll just reaward it to her next week. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, I have some feedback, and this feedback is from Judy. She sent an email, and she had a few things to talk about. So first of all was gun laws. So she said that we were talking about guns and how it can be legal to sell them to people who are felons, and she said, we live in Indiana where there are soft gun laws, so this might not be legal in every state. But here it goes. If you legally own a gun, 
rifle, shotgun, handgun as an individual, you can directly sell your gun to another individual for cash or whatever with no paperwork and no background checks. Well, you can do that in a lot of states. Oh, you can? Okay. Sure. Well, that doesn't seem like a good idea. No, but that's how you circumvent the gun laws. So she says, you cannot sell a handgun for, some, for someone unless you are a dealer or use a dealer to do the paperwork and background check. Kind of dumb, right? She says, this is the gun show loophole that we've been hearing about. Right. Okay. So it's not only gun shows, it's person to person. Yeah. So you can do that. Of course. You shouldn't be allowed to do that, I think. And maybe gun people will find what? that irritating and ignorant that I say that. Okay. So it's not only Indiana Judy, but thanks for sharing. Another thing she brought up was Darlie Routier, and that was the mother who killed her two sons. Stabbed them. Stabbed them and pretended that uh, an intruder had come in. And right. part of it was that at the grave they did the silly string, and people found that very callous. Yeah. So Judy says, I remember this being big in the news. We mostly heard about the silly string at the cemetery, and this made Judy mad. So she says, but not for our reasons. She says when her grandmother died, that she took her two- and four-year-old boys to visit her grave a few months later, and they sat on her grave eating snacks and blowing bubbles for her because she loved bubbles. I know this is a bit different in timing, and old-age death is different than murdered. So that's what I was going to say, Judy, is old-age death and murdered children are very different things because someone dies of old age, you're celebrating the life they had. Right. Right. And, and I don't see any big thing about kids visiting the grave and blowing bubbles and eating. Right. But what if the kids did silly string? You'd be okay with that, but just not the mother. Right. I mean, they're kids. Right. And this wasn't, this. these were adults doing silly string. On well, the, I think they might have brought some kids from the family with them. But it was the adults who led the, the parade. Yeah. And I wouldn't have found her guilty just based on that. Just based no. on the silly string, right? I wouldn't have uh, either. That shouldn't even be evidence. But she also said that she always thought that Darley was wrongly convicted. After listening to your coverage and how you laid it out in the time frame of what happened, it is a stretch to think she is innocent. She would have to be the luckiest person on earth. Lucky, I don't... Oh, the unluckiest, I'm sorry. She would have to be the unluckiest person on earth. What do you think? Well, I agree. Yeah. I mean, I think that the physical evidence made it pretty clear that uh, she did it. As I recall, it was a very elegant workup of how the, the crimes occurred. Yes. So? Yeah. So I, I Just reading that, I thought she was guilty from the get-go. Well, yeah, we did think she was guilty. I don't think she was wrongly convicted, but Judy, I would agree with you that just doing silly string, we're all different. We all do different things. Yeah. I mean, that didn't even enter my mind when I was thinking about guilt versus innocence. No, it just seemed like a bit of frosting on the cake once you already decided she was guilty. I guess. Maybe. But it didn't really matter to me either. Okay, another thing that Judy said is about jury duty. So she says, um, I was a bit offended when both you and Dick seemed to agree that if a person on jury duty was not up to date on a crime story, that they must not be terribly intelligent. I purposely do not follow 24 hours news coverage. Why? Because so much of it is wild guessing and drama for no reason. When the runaway bride thing happened years ago, my mom spent hours glued to the set to follow it. By the time I read about it in Newsweek, it was a complete story that took me 10 minutes to read to get the actual facts. I have felt mostly the opposite. People who follow Fox News and HLN, I think, tend to make assumptions and believe facts forever, even though they turn out to be false. Like all the people worrying about black men carjacking their kids away from them, thanks to Susan Smith. So, Judy... I totally agree with you on that. I don't follow 24 hours news coverage. I would not be caught dead in front of Fox News. And I wouldn't follow HLN either. I mean, we've made fun of Nancy Grace ourselves. We have. Now, in this and, case... And we feel badly about it. <laughs> <laughs> in the whole Casey Anthony case, we were talking about Jeff Ashton, the prosecutor's book, where he felt like he got a bum rap with the jury because they didn't seem to have any knowledge of the case. If they were to make it on the jury, they couldn't have any knowledge of the case. So what do you think about that? I think she's got a good point here. This is something I wanted to discuss a little. Well, I think she's got some point. Yeah. But I think you want to have jury people that are aware 
Sure. And, and But being aware doesn't mean you have to follow all these. No, it doesn't. No. But I, I think you want to have people on a jury that can think for themselves and draw their own conclusions. Right. And that doesn't mean that they have to be aware of the case in its entirety or anything like that. So you're saying they probably should have heard about it because it was such a big news story. I I think for sure. Yeah. If if they say, oh, I don't know anything about it. That does seem a bit oblivious to your world. They're living in a bubble. Maybe. But then even living in a bubble, I think once you heard about it, you'd have to be able to make your own decisions and think well, about it independently. Absolutely. And a lot of them didn't seem to be able to do that. No. And I, I don't think we were knocking it for that reason. Well, I think we may have come across as saying, oh, if you're not up to date on the news, then you're not very smart. But I don't know if yeah. I feel that way. I mean... I don't know that we came across that way. But I don't know. I mean, you're the one that reads the New York Times, the Globe. You do a lot of reading of the news. And I am oblivious to a lot of things until you come up and tell me. Well, not really. I mean... Uh, Kind of men. When when I say something about oh did you hear about this and you've heard about it through other media, maybe but not as much. I don't think I'm that. I'm not always that knowledgeable about what's going on in the world. Yeah, I don't know. And I can certainly see that following HLN or Fox News or whatever doesn't make you a smarter person. Oh, I would agree. It may be the opposite, as she <laughs> was kind of alluding to. <laughs> Well, <laughs> no, I'm not going to say that. But I think you do have to be aware of your surroundings and be making your own judgments on things. And I, maybe... I think you have to be able to look at the facts and make your conclusions based on the facts. Right. And whether you're that knowledgeable about the case or not. Right. I think you have to be open-minded and be able to be able to form your opinion. Yes. Okay. I mean, another thing I think was, and this is probably stepping on a landmine, but... A lot of people who could do jury duty were people who didn't have very demanding jobs or other pressing engagements, which could have made them a little less educated or aware of the world around them. Possibly. Is that a I think prejudiced thing to say? I think you've stepped on the line, landmine. Um, the, the other thing, I mean, there, there's always going to be people that want to be on the jury. Yes, that's true. For cases, so... And there are know. also reasons why you might avoid following things on the news, because it can bring you down. Yeah. You might be at a point in your life where you're like, I can't deal with this right now. I'm going to stay distracted with other things. I've certainly been there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thanks, Judy, though. Judy made some great points. I appreciated she did. that. I, I liked what she's written. So yeah. I hope she'll keep listening and keep recommending things or keep talking to us. Well, you have to say she is paying attention to us, if not HLN. I mean, she definitely <laughs> had some insight into the things we've been talking about. Yeah. Okay. So, and and they were, there were things that were uh, good to hear about. Yeah. So. Right. I hope she'll continue contributing. Yes. So what else have you got? You've got one more letter? I got one more. This is a feedback on the Sylvia Likens case from P.A. Craigie. Okay. I'm, I'm impressed. This woman lives in New Zealand. Why is that impressive? I mean, New well, Zealand's fine, but why is it more impressive than somewhere else? Well, I th always figure, you know, we're provincial. We have the United States, but you've got international people listening to us. This is the age of the internet, baby. Yeah. It's a small world. So P.A. Craigie says about the episode and Sylvia Likens, which took place in the 60s. Uh, and we were talking about how we're not sure it could happen that way these days. We were hoping it couldn't. We were. But she says, during the episode, you both talked about how the 60s was a different time and people would act differently now and do the right thing, probably. But sadly, I have to bring this case to your attention. So this must be a more recent case. I wish this could say this happened in some other country than mine, but I can't. It happened right here in New Zealand, a place that should be paradise, especially for children. So, Moko Rangito Hariri, I hope I didn't butcher that name too much. Sounded pretty good. Was an adorable little three-year-old boy with a huge toothy grin. He, like Sylvia, wasn't from the best home, but his mother loved him and did the best she could for him. When one of Moko's siblings was hospitalized for a serious illness, one of Moko's mother's best friends offered to take Moko and one of his sisters and care for them so she could stay with the sick child. 
What that friend and her boyfriend did to Moko over the time he stayed with them was disgusting and beggars belief. It's horrific stuff. Moko, like Sylvia, was tortured and starved while his older sister and the four children of the couple went to school every day in clean clothes with homemade sandwiches and treats. When Moko was finally taken to the hospital after he became unresponsive, the doctors treated him, doctors treating him described his little body as a road map of abuse. He died of blunt force trauma, and there was evidence he had been smothered. So it's not enough that they kill this kid. No. The final insult after Mocha's death came when the Crown Prosecutor made a deal with the couple in exchange for their guilty pleas. They pled out to a reduced charge of manslaughter, and that triggered a flood of protests across New Zealand as the outraged public expressed their anger at the court for giving these people any kind of leniency. The prosecutor received death threats, and no amount of explanations in TV interviews could excuse his appalling decision to plead out a case when there is so much physical evidence that a trial would have been a slam dunk. Now, fortunately, the judge in the case was having none of it, and while he couldn't throw out the plea bargain, he could sentence Moko's killers to the maximum allowable penalty of 17 years, with a minimum of nine years to be served before they are eligible for parole. And then she goes on to say, now before Dick's head explodes at that apparently lenient sentence, New Zealand does not have the same sentencing structure as the United States. There's no such thing as a full life sentence, and most offenders are eligible for parole after serving half of their sentences. The judge really did give them the most years he could, and the chance that either of them will get parole before their 17 years are up is very, very small. So... Interesting case. Okay. Another another uh, similarity to Sylvia Likens. So it doesn't say what year this happened? Well, it was fairly recent, so it's 50 years after Sylvia. Oh, okay. So it was in the recent past. Okay. Recent past. Okay. Yeah. I've gotten a few emails with people saying, well, don't you know the data? This stuff happens. And you keep saying, oh, my God, I can't believe this would happen. Well, I'm never going to say, oh, yeah, that's expected, because well, no. to me, it's it's yeah. unimaginable. I don't care what the facts say about this kind of thing happening. To me, it's unimaginable. That's how I feel about it. Sure, it happens this percentage of the time, and this many mothers kill their children. It's still unimaginable, unconscionable. I'm not going to stop being upset and amazed by it. It's just not going to happen. You're so, right. Don't you think? Because that's not going to change with us, is it? No, it's not. No. P.A. Craigie, thank you for writing in. I really appreciate the feedback. I know the feedback is still a fairly new thing, but I'm hoping we'll get more and more of it because it really adds a new aspect to the podcast. It's more interactive. I really like that. And I, th I think the people that are writing in are very thoughtful. They put a lot of thought into it. I'm impressed. Yeah. All right, so that'll wrap it up for today. We'll talk to you next week. Free Mickey. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Everybody tweet it out because we got to get Mickey out before next week. That's right. We got for the green beer. Six more days. All right. I think he's learned his lesson. I think so. Okay. I, I think he's penitent. Absolutely. Okay. Bye bye. See ya.